Welcome, everybody. Actually, wait, I need my video on. There we go. So, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Keen at Concord University in the Environmental Geosciences program. And I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Julie Brigham Gret, who is uh, here as a distinguished lecturer with the Geological Society of America's Continental Science Drilling Division. Uh, she, and uh, she's one of two distinguished lecturers this year. And fitting the, the times, of course, this is a virtual lecture, which is a little unusual. Traditionally, these have involved the speakers actually traveling out to the host institutions, uh, but we're doing this online instead. Uh, but this also gives us a better opportunity to maybe record and, and save for posterity and, <laughs> and reach out, make this accessible to a lot more people than otherwise probably could have participated. Uh, so Julie's going to be talking about research on, uh, sometimes people just call it Lake E. Yep. <laughs> I've heard of it called Lake E quite a lot because uh, most people look at the, the name and are a little bit stumped in terms of how they should pronounce it. Uh, and uh, so Lake E is uh, an Arctic lake. Uh, so we could say it's one in one of the two polar regions. And so it's in, uh, in Russia and a place that tends to be kind of chilly in the, the winter, as you might expect for a polar region. Uh, the lake itself is uh, over 3 million years old and has uh, thus a quite long record in the sediments of past climate and environmental changes. And so Julie's going to be talking about what it took to get that core in a fairly remote area and challenging environment and uh, the outstanding science that, that came out of this project. Uh, so thank you again, Julie, for being with us. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. So I can go ahead? Yes. Okay. Well, thanks uh, everyone for uh, this invitation to share with you the outcomes of the Lake Elgagikin project. We still have a lot uh, yet to publish in the next year or two, but at least I'd like to give you some of the highlights. And first of all, I wanna uh, first acknowledge my co-chief scientists on the project. This was a US, Russian, German, um, US, Russian, German and Austrian project. And the co-PIs are listed there, Martin Mellis, Pavel Manuk, and Christian Korbel uh, from the University of Vienna. And we did this uh, together as a team. So um, I don't want anyone to think that I did this all by myself, but this was a, a large group effort. And you'll notice that my title, that this changes everything, really refers to the fact that this record is so unique and has taught us so many new things that it really does change a lot of what we know about the polar regions. And I've taken this title from this book by Naomi Klein, This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. And there's a quote in here that it's a civilizational wake up call that a powerful message spoken in the language of fires, floods, droughts, and extinctions telling us that we need an entirely new economic model and a new way of sharing the planet. So, some of the take home points that I want to talk about today is really about this re phenomenal record that Lake Elgagikin uh, records the last 3.6 million years and informs us of millennial scale, meaning, you know, on thousand year and hundred years uh, uh, timescales, uh, climate change in the polar regions. And it's literally 36 times longer than what we can see in the Greenland ice sheet. In this record, we found for the first time evidence of what we call super interglacials. And in fact, warm interglacials that um, weren't really recognized in the Arctic before. Use, looking at these, the Lake Elgagikin record and then comparing it to what we know from the ice sheet history of Antarctica and Greenland, we now know that in fact, the ice sheets are much, much more sensitive to the uh, even a small amount of warming than we ever thought before. Therefore, 
the bottom line here is that we really need new social and economic strategy for managing our coastlines. And I want all the students listening in to, to remember that where we see challenge, there's opportunity. And that's really the most, a really important message. So how do we warm the planet? We know from the geologic record, there's a couple ways to do that. And I'll talk about two, the main two uh, reasons for changes in the climate of the temp uh, temperature of the, of the world, uh, at least over the last few million years. One of them is the shape of the Earth's orbit around the sun. We know that changes in our orbit are caused by uh, obliquity or the uh, tilt that happens on cycles of about 41,000 years. Changes in eccentricity, which is the shape of the shape of that orbit from around the sun being from more elliptical to being more circular. And then precession, which really describes you know, the season in which we come close to the Earth. And we now understand that these, this is the mechanism that really modulated glacial interglacial changes. We also know that we can change the temperature of the planet using greenhouse gases. And here I'm showing the greenhouse gas CO2 taken from the Antarctic ice sheet, the Epica ice core that goes back 800,000 years. And what you'll notice is here I've labeled the glacial, interglacial, glacial, interglacial changes that are in, in response to those, that orbital change in our, in our planet over time. And you can notice particularly that there is a kind of a normal range that over the last eight, at least 800,000 years where we have fossil air preserved in the ice cores, we can see that it went from about 180 to 280, 180, 280, 180, 280. So it varied. Um, CO2 went down naturally and rose and fell with its changes in orbit and also the feedbacks that operate between the atmosphere and the ocean and the land. Where we are today, however, is up here in this box, this very vertical uh, change in CO2 that's been caused by uh, human activities. And just to, let's put this in, into co some context here. This is my family plotted on this curve, this nearly vertical curve. So I wanna make the point here that um, here's where CO2 was when my grandmother was born in 1898. It was at 295 parts per mil. My parents were born around 1925, and it was about 305. I was born in 1955, and it was at about 313. My two sons were born at when it was around 350, and today we're up at 414. So this is a dramatic rise in the duration of my family history. So this is 100 and call it rounded up to 120 years since my grandmother was born. We've made this amazing change in our atmosphere. And we haven't had an atmosphere like this in about 3 million years. This has consequences, of course, because it, it is causing the, the, the Earth to warm. We can see on the left the NOAA Arctic Research Program's projections for uh, global mean temperatures, possibly by 2100, uh, up here at around uh, four or five degrees. And um, then there's a, a a better scenario, let's call it here in the blue, that has global temperatures up around two degrees or so. We've already wrote, changed the temperature of the planet by one degree, so we're halfway there. And of course, in the Arctic, because of Arctic amplification, polar amplification, what happens to the globe is, is amplified uh, because of processes related to albedo and so on, that the Arctic will get anywhere from two, for every one degree of temperature rise globally, the Arctic can be as much as um, three degrees warmer uh, per degree. So uh, if, if, it's, if we're gonna rise the temperature over the next 80 years by say four degrees, then you can expect the Arctic's gonna perhaps hit much higher than that. So um, the Arctic is a amplified signal of on, on a global scale. So, so this warming uh, world that we're in, of course, has, has uh, impacts on, on how essentially the whiteness of the Arctic as we melt more, more snow and ice, particularly the sea ice, we're changing, turning the Arctic in summer from a very uh, white surface 
very reflective with high albedo to a very dark surface with a lot of open ocean. And here you can see that this year, this blue line here is the 2020 uh, change in ice. By, oh, by the way, let me apologize. I'll tell you the axes here. This is millions of square kilometers of ice, uh, just square kilometers in area, versus from January uh, to December 31st. So this is a one year cycle on the bottom. And uh, the gray here is the uh, average over the time period from 2000 to 2010. And so you can see how 2012 was the last minimum here in sea ice. And um, to, today, here in November, we've actually reached the lowest ice extent in any November on record. So, so we're seeing these big changes. It more easily comprehend is to see the changes in Greenland. So this is a, an archive photo from 1935 of a fjord in Greenland. And in a more recent photo, it looks like this. So if we just toggle back and forth, and it, the, the perspective isn't exactly right, but you can really make out how different Greenland is becoming as we're melting the ice very quickly. And we now know from NASA's uh, ice bridge programs and other things that the interior of Greenland, uh, as these ice sheets retreat inland, it's actually retreating into a basin. The center of Greenland is a big, uh, big basin. So it's not like heading into the mountains. The mountains are along the east coast of, the, of Greenland, but it's backing into its interior. And this will have consequences for how fast and how we understand these ice, these ice retreat. So we have a lot of scientists working in Antarctica, around parts of Greenland, even on Svalbard, looking at the mass balance of these glaciers. They're slow, sluggish beasts. So the response that they're, that they're undergoing today is, is really, they're responding to what happened a couple of decades ago. So there's a long lag time in how these systems operate uh, uh, and how fast they flow. We know that in Greenland and Antarctica that a lot of the ice retreat and the loss of these floating ice shelves is being caused by very warm water now coming in underneath and melting up, melting these ice shelves like this. And again, as they retreat back, they retreat into deeper and deeper terrain. So here, this is a figure by one of my colleagues, Rob DeCanto and his colleague, Dave Pollard at Penn State. Here they're showing that uh, the buttressing effect of these ice shelves and how important they are for holding up the ice behind. So these really act like a buttress that holds back the ice. But as these ice shell floating ice shelves collapse, they create, in fact, this, this tremendous wall that's really unsupported. So here, this lower diagram is kind of shown. I've given you a picture to give it a little more reality. Here's a 90 meter high cliff in Antarctica on an ice shelf. But just imagine that this goes down 800 meters below. And if we just think about how buttressing works in a cathedral, if you re remove the buttresses, the cathedral is going to fall. And that's uh, architecturally built that way. And, un and unfortunately, this is certainly the way some of these ice sheets are operating. So, um, so we now know that they're more susceptible, they're melting, the earth is warming. And so we're thinking about what's happening with global sea level. And here we are today where this star is here and projected out to 2100 are kind of a worst scenario or a best case scenario at the present. And you see estimates out here around uh, approaching a meter, more like 80 centimeters globally in the, in the near future. But what my point with this slide is to say, let's start thinking about the fact that this, what we do now, the trajectory that we go on now in the future has a policy relevance for how, how sea level will change in the future. So what does the geologic record tell us? What does the Arctic geologic record tell us about climate change in the Arctic and, and about perhaps about this ice sheet history? So um, we have to think about a world around three to four or five million years ago here in the Pliocene. We had the Pliocene warm period. 
And there were no Northern Hemisphere ice sheets at all. We had an ice-free uh, Northern Hemisphere. We had an ice cap in Antarctica. So we had, instead of having ice at two poles, we only had ice at one pole. And then somewhere around 2.6 million years ago, we started to have um, warm, we started to have ice sheets developing in the Northern Hemisphere. And we started the oscillations of glacial, interglacial, glacial, interglacial change. So we went from these one bubble to another bubble to back and forth over the last 2.6 million years. So we can use these, this paleoclimate, this past climate change record, we can use it like a playbook. You know, the football team and the coach, they have a, they have a play, playbook. If we do it this way, if it goes this way, this is gonna be the outcome. So think about the geologic record as like a playbook where we can go back and see how did it happen before? What led up to those things that led for these events to happen? And let's understand and use these natural experiments in the geologic record to understand how quickly processes could be operating today. And I don't know how many of you in, uh, are familiar with the um, concept of Doctor Who. But Doctor Who, if you um, watch any of this, he's a time lord and he can go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards in time and look at, at Earth history. And this is, I want you to think of yourself as a time lord. We can go back in the geologic record, go back two, three million years, look at what happened, and then use climate modeling to go forward in time to see how this plays out. So I like to think of ourselves, geoscientists, as time lords. So let's look at this deep record from Lake El Gigikin. It was a meteorite impact lake created here in northwest, northeast Russia, right on the central part of Chukotka, area of known as Chukotka. The meteorite hit 3.6 uh, million years ago. At that time, uh, and it created this large crater that today is about uh, 18 kilometers across, and the lake itself today is 175 meters deep. So just think about the George Washington Monument. If you stuck the George Washington Monument into the lake, the very top of the George Washington Monument would barely stick out of, of the surface of the lake. So this is a really phenomenal place. And I've always thought, you know, if this meteorite had just hit a few hours earlier, it would have hit in Alaska and it'd probably be a national park. <laughs> so a couple of things about the team. We had all these countries, Russia, Germany, Austria, United States. We came together, we had a lot of planning and we want to carry out this very interdisciplinary science. And the other thing, the other objective we wanted to have is we wanted to remain colleagues afterward. This is not always hard, easy to do. And it's, I think, one of our group's successes is if we've more or less maintained um, wonderful collegiality through all of the various um, cultural issues and, that we work through scientifically. This drilling was part of the International Polar Year, which spanned two years, 2007 to 2009. And so, all of the member countries see this as a big success from that international polar year. So how did we carry it out? This took a lot of planning. We um, first had some containers, two or three containers from Germany, take the Siberian Railroad across to Vladivostok. On our side and the United States side, we shipped a drill rig in 15 containers from the United States, from Bellingham, Washington, across the North Pacific to Vladivostok. Within a week, they were put on a barge and they made the last trip, the last ship coming in in 2008 to deliver into Pivik up here on the coast of the, of the Arctic. And then we had to get from Pivik out to Lake El Gigikin, a, a distance of about 350 kilometers. And it was in the dead of winter. So we had to have bull, Russian bulldozers pulling uh, trucks with the containers out to the drill rig using whatever roads were available. And I'll just show you here in a second. Here's an idea. Here's Pivik, 
Uh, and here's the lake down here. So we used frozen roads. This, this road here, uh, you can see around here, uh, is this one here. You can, there is a truck way down here for scale. It's a little black speck. Then this is a winter, a summer road that gets blown uh, free of snow. And you can see that here. And then we did the last 90 kilometers came in pulling these um, trucks with the bulldozers. So it was an amazing undertaking to get all of this together and all of the logistics. Uh, the whole field program was about $10 million. We then set up uh, in January, February, March, once the ice on the lake was about a meter thick, the Russian bulldozers made an ice pad about uh, took away the snow, and then we pumped water up out of the lake and flooded a, a, the surface, creating an ice platform that was two meters thick. So we were creating this floating uh, uh, platform two meters thick so that it could support a hundred ton drill rig on two meters of ice sitting over 175 meters open water. And our camp was if you can kind of trace all the way back over here, we had the camp on shore uh, seven kilometers here off to the side. So it was quite an uh, undertaking. What we successfully accomplished was we drilled a series of boreholes, uh, two boreholes A and B that uh, completely captured the entire quaternary, so back to 2.6 million. And then we had just enough time to take one borehole down through the Pliocene and then we went 200 meters into the impact rocks down below. In fact, I'm wearing a necklace made of the impact ejecta. So that this thing that I'm wearing around my neck is 3.6 million years old. Just a quick comment about teamwork. We started this project. I first heard of this lake in 1994. Most of you were not born yet, okay? And my older, my younger son was one year old at the time. It took us about 15 years to finally get to drilling. And we've now been publishing over the last 10 years about this project. We have over 70 manuscripts um, uh, out as an outcome of the project. So one of my lessons to you is if you have a good idea and you, and you can, you don't give up, keep trying and eventually things happen. So I want to uh, talk about some of the highlights from the lake here. And uh, I'm going to do this in the context of this curve. You've seen a little bit of it before. This is what's called the Lasecki ramo uh, curve that represents a, kind of a proxy for climate change, the warm Pliocene here with high CO2, around 400 parts per mil. And then we came into the glacial interglacial world of the Pleistocene. So this is an ocean record. It represents kind of the, our, our, um, uh, our benchmark for understanding the climate change. And my, one of my points for showing this figure is that I want you to appreciate the Greenland ice cores only cover about the last 100,000 years. Antarctic ice cores go back to ice cores, go back to 800,000 years. And yet the El Gigitkin core goes back 3.6 million years. We've never had a record like this from any part of the Arctic. And that's what makes it completely unique. And I'm, I'm afraid to say it may, in fact, be the only place like this. It's the deepest, largest non-glaciated basin anywhere in the Arctic. So we process the core with a lot of really high-tech equipment, including all these uh, core scanning, which allows you to take very high resolution measurements every millimeter, if you like, on a number of different proxies that give us the ideas about climate change and changes in sediment. Um, and so we're able to look at a lot of different proxies that tell us something about what was going on sedimentologically. So I'm going to cover a couple of those, and then I'll give you some of the highlights. So when the meteorite hit 3.6 million years ago, this is what North America looked like, a little different than today. There is no Hudson's Bay. The, all the Arctic islands are connected as one contiguous landmass. And there was no Greenland ice sheet. In fact, there's barely much of an Iceland even uh, that's emergent here. 
most of my research over, over my career has been in the Bering Land Bridge area between Alaska and Russia, working both on and offshore. And I've worked at a number of different sites where we have pieces of information about the, what's happened over the last three and a half million years. This is the first place in El Gagikin where we have the entire 3.6 million years all in one place, just like an ocean core. And so this is a, has been a, a, a tremendous thrill. But three million years ago, when this meteorite hit, this was a different world, a contiguous North America. And we had um, even Arctic camels. It was warm enough for these early Arctic camels to exist. And we had mean annual temperatures, even on Ellesmere Island, uh, possibly 19 degrees warmer than today at, at that time. So very different world. We think that the Arctic forests went right up to the Arctic Ocean and probably very little, uh, no sea ice in summer for sure, probably a little bit in the winter time. Very different. One of the, one of the next things that we learned about uh, from this record is really what the demise of the Arctic for, uh, forests were. I like to think about what, I, what I'm really interested in is how did we go from a forested Arctic with no ice sheets to an, I, an ice uh, covered Arctic that we have today. And how did that tree line change? What we learned from this record is that the tree line migration southward as the earth cooled, as we went into Northern hemisphere uh, glaciation was, was actually complicated. Here, 3.4 million years ago, we can see these boxes here are representing various ecotones. So the top red one here is a mixed cool forest like you see up here. The next one is a cool conifer forest, like you see figured here. Then taiga, and then into deciduous, cold deciduous forest, and then into tundra. So if we, so I've widened the boxes just so you could see that in fact, it wasn't until we got to almost 2.4 million years ago that we really had primarily a tundra, an Arctic with a lot of tundra, that in fact, the, um, the retreat of the forested areas with the onset of glaciation was, was much more complicated. If and I take this figure and I'm going to turn it up on its end now, here we go. We're going to flip it around on its side. And so here we see on the left the same figure with the changes in vegetation over time from 3.6 million years ago to 2.2 or so. We can we can actually map out um, the change from very forested conditions here to tundra. So you can see the trend goes from open, uh, from very forested conditions eventually to tundra, but it was a much more complicated story. So this is fascinating to people in uh, uh, biogeography or in ecology in trying to understand how these forests change. And you can see that the forests came and went, came and went back and forth until we re really re reached this tundra environment. So this is really interesting and in how, how we went from that forested Arctic into glacial interglacial change. The other thing that's really fun about Lake Okagikan is the sedimentology. I love looking at these pictures and I love looking at pictures of the cores because they're just beautiful. First of all, these are the major sediment facies that we find in the core. A is uh, uh, basically the first time we, what we call a glacial facies. And, and let me explain for a minute. When I say that this is a glacial facies, it doesn't mean that area was glaciated. Remember I said it was not glaciated. What we mean is when we get this kind of mud in the lake, it means that the lake ice was permanent the year round. So we may have had several meters of ice and it never melted in the summertime. So during these cold glacial events, much like the lakes in Antarctica today, they never opened up. But during common interglacials, we had this kind of facies that you see here in B. And during super interglacials, we have laminae, laminae with rich with diatoms, telling us about extremely warm conditions, so warm, and with, the, with decomposition of organic matter um, actually resulting in some anoxia in the bottom of the lake to allow the preservation of these 
uh, laminae. The other two fascias here you see on the right hand side are very complicated. These in fact could be varves, but these two sediment fascias are never seen in the Pleistocene. So we have a very huge change in how this lake operated from a probably very warm Arctic in the Pliocene until we went into the glacial interglacial changes. And what I want to really focus on today are really the super interglacials here. What was the cause of these? This is really one of the major milestones from the Elga Kicka project is the recognition that we had these super warm interglacials in the past. And the question is what caused them? So here are these facies again, A, B, C, and the Pliocene. And I want you to look at these cartoons. These are photographs just that gives you a snapshot of what we mean. So here's A, here's the lake, here's the lake today. It opens up in the summertime. It has, it's frozen in the wintertime. Facies uh, B, oh, sorry, this is backwards. I just realized this slide is backwards. This is the facies A here, this is B, and this is C. I'll, I'll change that. Excuse me for that mistake. So my point here is facies C, the super interglacials, occur throughout the record. They're quite common, particularly back in the um, starting around 2.8 million years ago, up through around about a million years ago. And then we don't see it, the super interglacials very, very commonly. So um, at the time, prior to a million years ago or so, roughly, the world, the cycles of glacial interglacial change occurred every 41,000 years. We, had, we call it the 41,000 year world. And as we come after a million years, the cyclicity, these orbital changes shifted their tempo and they became more of 100,000 year changes in glacial interglacial change. And right now there's a lot of scientists working on what caused that change, what was, what was the reasons for it. And, and, uh, and whoever figures it out completely and uh, is, is gonna have a major paper on their hands. So it's an ongoing area of research. One of my points with this slide is to point out that we had actually as many as 17 super interglacials and most of them occurred in the 41,000 year world. So what caused these and why were they more common in a 41K world? Many of these super interglacials, these, this, this red unit, are associated with high periods of time when we know sea level was, much, was higher than today. So that's also another important point. Super interglacials are associated with high relative sea level. So what's the mechanism for the super interglacials? Um, one of the things we tried to explore was, was there anything going on in the open ocean that looked particularly different during these super interglacials? So to answer that question, I, we looked at here on the bottom is going from zero to 3.6 million. In red, I have the super interglacial facies where they occur through time. And you can see they're not regular. There's nothing regular about them. And above here, I have several uh, records. This is a compilation by Tim Herbert of the tropical uh, sea surface temperatures in the, open, in the ocean. The next curve in a, in a slight blue is by Akira Lawrence, which is a compilation of ocean surface temperatures in the North Atlantic. And then above it is that Lasecki Ramos stack representing that. Um, uh, archive that we like to compare with. And you, what we can see here, I've highlighted in the blue lines that in fact, these two interglacials here um, and this one here, you can see that there's really nothing extraordinary in the ocean record that suggests that, that seems to make the, the super interglacial stand out. So there's got to be something else um, that we can think about in terms of what's causing these super interglacials. So we don't see anything re especially remarkable uh, at first glance. So at the time that we were drilling Lake El Gigikin, here on the right, you see our drill rig on the, out on the lake ice. At the same time, papers were now just coming out from Antarctica, where a, a consortium of countries, New Zealand, the UK, Italy, and Germany, and the United States, 
we're drilling through the, the Ross ice shelf into the Ross Sea, into sediments, to understand what was the history of the West Antarctic ice sheet. So these two programs were happening at, at roughly the same time. So here's the, the Andrill story, an Antarctic drilling. And here is this little cartoon of their drill rig sitting, drilling through the ice shelf, down through the water column, into the sediments below. And here are the sediment facies that they found that represent different environments that reflect the fluctuations in the West Antarctic ice sheet. Here we see what's called glacial diamict or glacial till. We see these uh, underneath that representing ice covered conditions. Here we see what are called sub shelf muds representing an environment underneath an ice shelf. And over here on the right, is a sediment referred to as the diatom ooze. This is rich um, uh, diatoms, which can only be deposited when there's completely open water in the Ross Sea. So we have these three main sediments, sediments here. So they pulled up a core, we'll pull up the core here, and here is what they found. And in the green colors, uh, hopefully you can see that the green colors here are the glacial tills, like you see over here, and the yellow zones in the core are the open water diatomaceous oozes. So in this core, whenever you see yellow, there was no West Antarctic ice sheet. So now let's compare that to Lake Elgagikin. So in the next diagram here, what I've done is on the bottom is the Andrill record uh, here. And this particular portion that I'm showing you goes from 2.2 million years ago to 3.6. So it's only the Pliocene going into the early Pleistocene. And the thing that you notice is in the Antarctic record, what the Andrill group found was there was in fact a period of almost a, a million years or more when there was no West Antarctic ice sheet about three, around three, three and a half million years ago during that warm Pliocene warm period. The ice advanced a bit, and then you can see there's several different yellow zones showing you that the West Antarctic ice sheet advanced and retreated, advanced and retreated. And if we compare that with El Gagikin on top here in green, this is our reconstruction of the mean temperature of the warmest month in summer. And the dotted line is what the area is like today. So you can see them all through the Pliocene and even in the early Pleistocene, the temperatures at Lake Ogagikan were, were warmer than today. But we can also see that there were intervals of time. These six bars in this time interval represent super the very onset of these, what we call super interglacial facies. And even though the chronology is not perfect enough to match perfectly, my six lines here match up pretty well, these six bumps of yellow indicating that possibly the, the in, super interglacials in Lake Ogagikin are co coincident with these periods of time in the early, late Pliocene, early Pleistocene when there was no West Antarctic ice sheet. It, we can also match them up in the younger part of the record. So this one on the top, we have from zero to 2.8 million years ago. And in below that, we have the facies. So emphasize facies C, and this is the uh, red boxes here are the various super interglacials. And we can see that in fact, there here and then on the bottom, I'm sorry, is the Antarctic drill core from the same interval, 2.8 up to the modern. And we can also see that there is are more open water areas here, even up to 2 million years ago, and even at, at a few other locations along this record, when there was no West Antarctic ice sheet. This record from, the, from Andrill was absolutely remarkable because it gave us this sense that Antarctica actually is much more dynamic and, and West Antarctica is much more vulnerable uh, to very small changes in warming. And in fact, they may match up with some of these super interglacials. Again, the dating is in particularly in Antarctica because of 
erosion. These little red squiggly lines here are areas where there's evidence of erosion because that's what ice sheets do. We don't, we can't match it exactly, but it's pretty close. Um, it's within the uncertainty of, of the dating. So we think it's a relatively good match. One of the best matches we have between Antarctica and, and, and the Lake Elgagikan record is in this uh, warm interglacier called 31. It happened about 1.1 million years ago. And it has a paleomagnetic reversal in the middle of it. So it gives us a really good anchor for matching these two records. So we're thinking about what caused the super interglacials. And I, I really don't have time to go into it today, but I just want you to know that we were thinking about, remember we, there are two ways to make the earth warm, CO2 or using the orbital forcing, the eccentricity, obliquity and precession. So what Raj Rajaduri is working on a paper right now in which he has found that in fact, there is in fact some kind of preconditioning of a very circular eccentricity orbit with high tilt. Um, and when those two come together, it synchronizes the two hemispheres. So we can talk about that later if you have some questions, but it, we finally found that in fact, there is a way uh, again, not seen before. This is a new product of this project is that we've been able to see that we can link what's happening in the two hemispheres and it has consequences for what's happening to the ice sheets. So this is again, this interval of 1.1 uh, million years ago when we think there was no West Antarctic ice sheet. In Lake Elgagikin, um, um, DeWitt published a paper, one of our grad students published a paper showing in fact that looking at the Elgagikin record, this stage 31 is actually an extremely long interglacial. And he was able to show that in fact, this in particular interglacial lasted almost 50,000 years. Most glacial interglacial change, interglacials are going to be around 10,000 years long. This one was 50, thousand years long, very exceptional. And it seems to be connected with this extreme or, uh, orbital forcing. He, Greg also found uh, in his core that in fact, this very warm period of warmth is represented in at least some of the marine cores around various parts of our, uh, our ocean basins. So we, we, we did find evidence for this. And so what Raj is doing now is we're looking at all some of the other super interglacials to see if we can make the same connection. So again, this stage 31 seems to be a really clear, it's our best, best connected rec record to the Elga Gikin when there was this very long super interglacial caused by orbital forcing, which drove a warmer world um, and caused the demise of the West Antarctic ice sheet. This also has consequences for Greenland because we now know uh, other groups of scientists can show that if we just go back to the last warm interglacial 125,000 years ago, Greenland may have contributed as much as two meters to sea level rise. And if we go back to earlier stage 11, this one around 400,000 years ago, and then this one at right 1.1 million, um, Greenland may have been much smaller ice sheet causing sea level to rise. And what's important to think about here is down below here, I plotted here is the temperature, mean temperature, the warmest month for the last 10, 12,000 years here. You can see this line is right around the present day. During 125,000 years ago, it was only a little bit warmer. We think the Arctic was maybe, the world was, um, the Arctic was only about one degree warmer than present. If we go back to stage 11, which again was a long interglacial, about 20,000 years long, we think that the world uh, was, was certainly a, a couple degrees warmer. And in fact, the Arctic here is summers were in fact um, something on the order of six to eight degrees warmer than, than present, just like they were in stage 31. So if, if we get two meters of sea level out of the last interglacial, and it's hardly only a one degree temperature change, Imagine what a much larger temperature change in the Arctic would do to the Greenland ice sheet. So we have a mechanism of 
trying to link Antarctica with the Arctic. Perhaps changes in sea ice in the Antarctic would cause a decrease in bottom water circulation. We somehow and our mechanisms have to come up with a way that explains not only linking these two in with warmth, but also looking at ocean circulation. So uh, we can talk some more about how that might work, but we think that the demise of the West Antarctic ice sheet and a decrease in sea ice changed the uh, production of Antarctic bottom water that isolates Antarctica today may have changed the amount of upwelling in the North Pacific and, and, and made changes in temperature in the Arctic. That they, so we think we're becoming close to a mechanism that helps us understand both the, the two polar records, but then we have got to integrate the oceans with that. So, so that's still, I think, a work in progress. So what do these super interglacials mean in terms of uh, the future? If we have these super interglacials and we know they're caused by orbital forcing, we can use the amount of orbital forcing as a driver to get an idea of how sensitive these ice sheets are to some kind of warming. If the warming is either carbon dioxide reduced or caused by orbital changes, they both result in the same thing, the demise of the ice sheets. And so it, so if we can match these up, if, if our hypothesis is correct, that every super interglacial may have been associated with the demise of the West Antarctic ice sheet it, and perhaps a much smaller Greenland ice sheet, this has very serious implications uh, for changes in, in sea level um, going forward into the future. But what do we know about Greenland? Let's look at Greenland for a minute. So this is the Greenland ice sheet today here in purple on the left. And over the years, people have drilled through the ice sheet into the bedrock below the Greenland ice sheet. And down there in the rocks, up here are some uh, rulers with rock core taken from the bottom of these ice core, these ice cores. They drill through the ice all the way to the rock on the, on the bottom of Greenland. And then what they do is measure the cosmogenic, race, uh, cosmogenic ray produced isotopes caused by cosmic ray bombardment in that rock. The idea being that the only way cosmic rays can penetrate into the rock at the bottom of Greenland is the Greenland ice sheet can't be there. It has to have been exposed. So here's this place where they took the drill core and some reconstructions of what the Greenland ice sheet looked. So you've got to get, you've, for, I, for cosmic rays to bombard this site, you've got to get rid of most of Greenland. So some papers were written recently kind of suggesting uh, how do we interpret the amount of cosmic ray isotopes, the accumulation of those isotopes in the rock? Was this one? Uh, so this is what we call the Goldilocks exposure histories. Here, this pink zone going back to about uh, almost one and a half million years. This is time scales from 0 to 2.5. And then here is. Um, was it a long open exposure time? And then with the, ice, the Greenland ice sheet existed throughout the last million years. Were the exposure times uh, spaced out during each interglacial? Um, or were the periods of exposure when we had the demise of the Greenland ice sheet, were they connected uh, perhaps to these super interglacials? How can we test that? So here are these Goldilocks scenarios. Um, here's the 100K world, the transition. Here's the 41K world. And here's the large exposure all at once idea. Here's the uh, let's spread the exposure out idea. And here is this more complicated history uh, back in time. So how do we test for that? Um, here is a reconstruction. One of our grad students, ben Benjamin Kiesling, what he did was model, um, create a, an ice atmosphere uh, climate model, which drove the waxing and waning of the Greenland ice sheet. And he 
And then as he grew, allowed the cli climate history from Lake Elgagikin to drive the ice sheet back and forth, he then in the model accumulated cosmogenic isotopes on the bottom of the Greenland ice sheet. So can he match by changing the size of Greenland, can he match the, the accumulated isotopes? And the truth is, yeah, he can do it. So what he's, he's come up with is, is a, a paper he has in press where it's, if he takes his climate model and drives the Greenland ice sheet, it's within the lens of possibility that in fact, most of that exposure was created during these, su these in super interglacial periods. So, so it's again a hypothesis, but it seems to be uh, working. So, so this, what does this tell us? The, the, the bottom line here is that means the Greenland ice sheet has come and gone many times. We now know from the Andrew record, the West Antarctic ice sheet has come and gone many times. And we now know from Lake Elgagikin that in fact, um, we had these super interglacials driven not by CO2 necessarily, but in fact by changes in orbital configuration, which provide this playbook of if you warm the world a little bit for whatever reason, these ice sheets will collapse. And so this has really big implications for what's happening now. We're warming the entire world. We're seeing the ice sheets starting to retreat rapidly. And so we know there's going to be uh, large changes, probably serious changes in sea level. And um, we already know what happens when we have large storms and large storm surges, which cause tremendous damage along our, along our coastlines. So we see that and we see the hurricanes. Um, uh, and yet we make the decision to rebuild, you know, it's in our human spirit somehow, we're gonna rebuild after disaster. Maybe that's not the best idea. Here is a map from, uh, uh, this is a site called Climate Central. You can go there yourself, find your favorite beach area, and you can toggle this little button up and down and see how sea level will be affected. This, I apologize, this is three feet, should be one meter, but this just shows you the parts of Southern Florida and the Key West with just a one meter or three, level, th uh, three foot increase in sea level. And here is a two meter rise in sea levels. You get, a, get the idea of, of how uh, on these very flat landscapes, how a very small change in sea level will have a huge change in the position of our coastlines. But look at that coastline in Florida. This is Miami Beach, the Miami skyline today, all of that infrastructure within a meter of sea level. And this on the right has a, this is a condominium. I took this photograph out of a airplane magazine pre-COVID. Um, this is an advertisement for a, a luxury condominiums here um, to be built in Miami. And yet who would put a 50 year mortgage uh, uh, on a building like this, if in fact the first floor might be flooded and may be repeatedly flooded uh, by storms. So, so we really have to think about this concept of managed retreat. And this is starting to catch on uh, locally in many coastal regions up and down the East Coast and throughout the Gulf of Mexico or uh, Gulf of New Mexico, um, the Gulf Coast. And we really have to think about are we doing the right thing if, if, as we have more and more infrastructure in harm's way? It's not just Miami. I'm working with native villages in Alaska where, again, all these villages are on very low, many of them on low um, coastlines, very low-lying coastlines, and they're seeing rapid retreat, which really threatens their communities. We actually have something on the order of 32 villages in Alaska that need to be moved, like uh, Shishmaref and Kivalina that are on these very low-lying barrier islands. And these people have lived together for centuries. They don't want to be just divided up into Fairbanks and Anchorage. They really want to, we want to move these whole villages. So this idea of managed retreat is really an important part of 
particularly in, in Alaska, as well as our, our uh, more economic coastlines. Here's a projection from a couple years ago of the number of people at risk by state. So you can see six, these are people a projected sea level rise of, of a meter or two. Um, we've got 6 million people in Florida. And if you add this all up, we're getting close to 8 million across all of these areas, on the, particularly in the Gulf Coast and down the, and the Atlantic coastline. So the important thing to think about is if all of these areas might be flooded, particularly over the next, say, 80 years, uh, 50 to 80 years, where are they going to move? Where are these are essentially going to be climate refugees that are going to need to move? Maybe to West Virginia, maybe to, to Northern Texas. Where are we going to move? How are we going to handle this? So we really need to think. This is an opportunity. We need to. Uh, 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 challenges are opportunity, and this is where we're really going to need a lot of of input from cities and towns, from geologists and urban planners, social scientists to work together. We already have trouble with nuisance flooding in many of our coastal areas. This uh, little squid went viral on the internet a few years ago. He, this little squid made its way up a drainage hole at high tide on a full moon in Miami, Florida and found its way up into this parking garage. Um, it's not meant to be there, and I'm sure this parking garage is not meant to be flooded with salt water, but they have nuisance flooding now, many coastal areas, just at high tide, just at high tide. So for me, as a geologist, trying to think about what is my science telling me? What is my, how can we use this science? How can it be actionable science? And I think what, what I'm learning from the Arctic and putting it together with Greenland and Antarctica is we're learning that these ice sheets are much more sensitive. We need to think about um, the increase in sea level rise. We need to think about the financial constraints, think about community planning and building, have a government's fr uh, governance framework for how to handle managed retreat. And it requires sensitivity and because people are attached. You know, if you're, if you're grandmother's house gets ruined in a, in a hurricane, you want to rebuild because that's where you came to see your grandma and you're sensitive to that. So we, we have to think about that. But the truth is, first graders today, by the time the first graders are 85 years old, sea level could be a, a meter higher, a couple, uh, a couple of feet. So we have to think about that. So my main point here is the take-home message I gave out from the beginning. Elga Gicken gives us an amazingly new record of the climate evolution of the Arctic over the last 3.6 million years, how we went from a forested Arctic to a glacial interglacial Arctic, and surprisingly finding a, a large number of super interglacials probably related not necessarily to CO2, but to orbital changes. But these provide us with a window for um, thinking about the repercussions of a world that warms due, due to CO2 uh, and not necessarily orbital changes that's happening within the lifetime of, one per, of even a, a young person today. And therefore, this is where actionable science is being called for. We need new social and economic strategy for how we how we manage our coastlines and think about uh, the infrastructure that is now in harm's way. The other thing I want to mention here is that maybe a personal journey. And this is me walking across the Sustrugi on the lake surface when we were out drilling. And the things that I learned from this um, were it's OK to take risk. It's OK. Sometimes in science, we take risks. And you have to follow your gut. If you got a good idea and you think it's worth it, you can, you can um, follow that passion and make a project happen. The other thing that I learned is you need to always have a plan B and you always have to have a plan C because not everything goes the way you want it to. The other thing I would suggest, don't give up easy. Stand your ground. If you've got a good idea, run with it. The other thing I learned is I needed, 
I need to, you know, accept advice with grace. Don't think you know everything. So that's kind of my global lesson for, for myself that I'd like to share with, with you. So with that, thank you very much. And I'll take your questions. Shall I unshare? Uh, you could just leave it up. Okay. Maybe maybe there might be a slide you want to uh, jump back to. Sure. Well, thank you, Julie. That uh, was really great. And we should also thank the uh, Geological Society of America's Continental Scientific Drilling Division for running this distinguished lecturer program that we're able to connect to. So we have a couple of different ways that the audience can put in questions. Uh, some people, a couple of people have already put questions into the chat. There's also a separate Q&A window and uh, I'll be checking on both of those. So the first couple of questions uh, I think might actually be related. Um, one is about uh, variations in openness, I think of the lake. Uh, and its relationship to Milankovitch cycles. And then another is about uh, the extreme orbital forcing. Right, so um, yeah, so the lake you see here in front of you, this is what the lake looks like at the end of July. So today, this lake is open completely like this for about two months, most of July and August. It starts to refreeze in uh, mid-September and um, it's pretty well frozen over with with ice into October and then of course it thickens over time up to uh, really into even March and April and then it starts to melt again and start to open up. So this is what we would call a normal interglacial kind of world in which um, the lake opens up, we oxygenate the bottom, we have high productivity. Um, um, and, you know, so this is the world we think it was, um, what it's like. And then in, in the cold glacial times, this lake that you see here is frozen even in August. It's completely frozen over. Uh, uh, just like the lakes in Antarctica and the dry valleys, those are frozen over the year around. And that's probably what this lake was like. It caused big changes in the oxygenation of the bottom. Uh, and so we have an idea of, of how this lake may have operated by understanding what's happening in, in the Antarctic lakes. It's interesting that one interpretation of the um, Siberian Yupik name, El Gagikin, is uh, either the Great White Lake or the lake that never thaws. So it, it's kind of interesting how, to think about how the lake uh, may have gotten, his, gotten its, uh, its name. Um, so on glacial interglacial set cycles, during glacials, this lake was frozen over with thick lake ice the whole time. And during interglacials, it opens up only in summer. So, so that's how we... Um, we really understand how this lake operates. The extreme orbits, um, uh, in fact, um, make sure I can go back to that, but the extreme orbits have to do with the, the, that we think precondition the, the um, super interglacials has to do with when we get a really circular orbit, a low, uh, very low eccentricity below a certain threshold, we get this very circular orbit then you don't get much of a seasonal uh, change between the two hemispheres. And in fact, what we found is looking at a parameter similar to um, uh, uh, positive degree days, we were able to see evaluate the duration of summer versus the uh, duration of summer versus the intensity of summer. And what we found is that for many of these super interglacials, not all, by the way, not all, but many of them, particularly the larger ones, the two hemispheres get synchronized 
and you get the uh, warm conditions in both hemispheres. It drives both hemispheres into an interglacial mode. And then once the orbit goes back a little bit hemispherical again, you, you get um, uh, high insulation in the northern and southern hemisphere in opposite parts of the season. So, so we think that there's a synchronization that happens with, uh, that has to do with the synchronization. And again, I, no one has recognized this before. In fact, the first time I showed a connection between the Arctic and the Antarctic was some years ago to, um, and showing some preliminary ideas and nobody would seen anything like this before. And so we've been working on it for a couple of years and we think we, we can't explain every interglacial, this warm interglacial this way, but it seems to be um, that it does in fact work for many of these larger super interglacials. So when Raj finishes writing it up, he and I are working on the manuscript now, um, we'll hopefully it'll pass peer review and, and and it, we think it's a new, a new idea that allows us to think about uh, synchronization of these two hemispheres. I hope that answered the question. All right, we have another one. Uh, as a woman in a STEM field, have you experienced the so-called imposter syndrome? And if so, how did you overcome it? Oh yeah. Um, yeah, um, and particularly uh, when I was going as an undergrad geology major, I think there were only two women in the whole department. <laughs> I went to a small liberal arts school. Um, there were maybe 30 majors and there were only two, two women. And um, when I got to grad school, um, again, there weren't a lot of women. It was even in, when I was in grad school, women weren't allowed to even go to Antarctica because there wasn't a place for them there. Um, uh, so we've come a long way and you do um, question yourself, but I have to say, I have been blessed over the years with having wonderful mentors. And, and interestingly, they've been men because that's there weren't many women in my field ahead of me, uh, but they were, they were really fair and treated me the same as the the male grad students and um, I eventually overcame a lot of that those insecurities um, uh, but but yeah I mean that's that's it, there have been a lot of challenges even just working in Russia where women uh, particularly in these remote areas are not given a lot of, of uh, respect shall we say um, so yeah we We've had some challenges, but uh, again, I thank my my mentors for really um, reminding me of and telling me what I was capable of, so I could start to believe it myself. <laughs> that's 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 great. Thanks. Yeah, uh, imposter syndrome is such a common thing, uh, and I mean, people go through and get entire PhDs and still feel like they're not really experts in the field that they just got their PhD in. <laughs> yeah, and if, you know, the other thing you, um, at one point or another, you realize, you know, you don't have to know everything. Um, I think what's more important is you have a passion for what you're doing. And I, you, I take every opportunity to learn about things from people who know more than I do about things. And you can bring teams of people together. And then as a collective, you can really do wonderful things, you know, um, um, start small and then think big because um, uh, the world is complicated. A lot of these scientific issues are complicated and we can't all be experts in everything. Um, I'm, I was wondering, is anyone going to ask me, well, why was the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at 400 parts per mil in the Pliocene? Does somebody want to ask me that? <laughs> you already asked the question. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I think it's really interesting to think about, well, we didn't have humans back then. Why was it so warm in the Pliocene? Uh, and we think for sure the only way you can maintain forested, this make this landscape you see in front of you in the picture, 
we know the only way you can keep a forested area there in winter and summer is you have to have high CO2. So our pollen and the vegetation story is consistent with um, a warmer, warmer world with CO2 in the range of about 400 parts per mil. The point being is that we were coming from say 55 million years ago, we had a carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in the Eocene about 55 million years ago, close to about 1500 parts per mil. So we had a high, very high CO2 world. We had a tropical world, we had even a tropical Antarctica, um, very warm world. And then uh, throughout over the last 55 million years, we've had a lot of tectonic uplift of the Himalayas, the creation of the of the Rocky Mountains, uh, the creation of the Andes. And when you uplift rocks, you start to weather them. And when you weather um, silicate minerals you're at, to clay, you are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So we call it the rock weathering thermostat. So as we built mountain ranges over the last 55 million years, it can uh, progressively decrease CO2 from something in the range of 1500 parts 1500 parts per mil down to about 400 parts per mil as we came through the through the uh, through the Pliocene. So a paper has been written about the onset of glaciation in Antarctica around 34 million years ago, still under a relatively high CO2, but due to the isolation, tectonic isolation of Antarctica and the development of the circuitman Antarctic current was involved there. But um, so, so the Pliocene was warm, the Arctic was warm and forested, no Greenland ice sheet, because we were coming out of a much higher CO2 world uh, uh, nat that the world uh, was naturally that way. So we came through a threshold around 2.6 million years ago that allowed the Northern Hemisphere to be repeatedly glaciated. So, it, um, so this is why Today, we're living in a Pliocene atmosphere. We haven't had an atmosphere like this since the Pliocene. No humans really have, have, have had this kind of atmosphere. So I just want to have you keep that perspective of how unusual today is. So that's, that's that mention of rock weathering as a effectively a very long term, much, yes. much longer term than glacial cycles, much longer term than these orbital changes. And so again, as like this rock weathering thermostat is, is actually an interesting one that people have been, have been thinking about for a while. Um, yeah, right. And it, it also, and, but it takes a long time. Really and long so time. what we're doing to the planet is in 100 years, we've reversed three million years of a rock thermostat in a hundred years, we've removed right. it. And so this has led people to the idea of, well, can we make use of this? Yes, uh, right. Right, so make it a tool. Uh, so, and, you, and somebody could imagine a very simple case. We have, let's say rocks that have calcium in them. And we break down those rocks with calcium. Maybe that gets washed down rivers into the ocean and now the ocean has more calcium in it. Right. And then, well, take heat, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, CO2. That's not very different from CO3. Well, what happens if you put calcium and CO3 together? You get calcite or limestone rock. Right. And so it's a way to essentially lock up large amounts of carbon dioxide on the ocean. And people are looking at, well, can we do this artificially in some fashion as a way of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, you bet. Um, just even taking crushed uh, basalt, various kinds of rock, crushed rock and using it as a fertilizer um, uh, and making it more available for, for chemical weathering uh, has been thought about. Interestingly, on one of my trips to Russia, I was actually the chair of a delegation for the National Academy looking at black carbon. And so the, in, the industrial world is creating black carbon that gets transmitted up onto the, onto the ice sheets and to the sea ice. And it's the blackening from the soot, from the, 
from black carbon that's actually enhancing the melting rate of some of these ice sheets. So we were going to Russia to talk to people about soot and black carbon. And we met, we were right in the middle of the largest coal production area of, of Russia. Okay, much like you guys are down there too in this pr producing a lot of coal. And what this scientist, Russian, uh, the Russian delegation leader was suggesting, he was coming up with a way to take coal and turn it into a fertilizer without allowing it to create any CO2. So, so you could make it for agricultural use. So what a, you know, this guy, if he can figure out how to do that, how to take coal and process it in a way that doesn't produce CO2, we could be using coal as a fertilizer. So there, these technologies are possible um, and, um, and maybe even enhance then higher productivity and, and try to, again, decrease the, um, the CO2 in the atmosphere. Right, again, tur turning something that, that was maybe looked at as a challenge into something beneficial. Um, Ab absolutely, so whether you're crushing up basalt to do it or whether you're finding some other way to just make our soils more productive increase the uh, productivity of our agricultural areas, be able to produce more food, not put all that extra, all those extra chemicals down into the Gulf um, where we're having these huge algae blooms. There's all kinds of interconnectivity in, uh, with this problem. And um, this is where, again, I can't emphasize enough, there are challenges, but these are opportunities. And that's, that's we need to t uh, turn that uh, turn up the thermostat on ideas, let's say. Right, and and one of the one of the challenges, of course, with doing that kind of thing with like all of this uh, rock or coal, is well the energy cost of let's say doing the crushing and the transporting. And right now, well, if we use our conventional energy balance, it's probably not going to be a win situation. It's going to take so much energy to do the rock crushing that it ends up not really getting us anywhere. But we're in the middle of this amazing and very rapid change in our energy infrastructure and our energy sources. I mean, it's, it is happening so much faster than people would have predicted a decade ago. Like actually, yep. it, over and over and over, the, the rapidity of which um, renewable energy sources have been taking over has been underestimated. Underpredicted yeah. again and again and again, and it keeps. Yeah, I mean, it, you look at, you know, Iowa, um, Oklahoma, and Texas are the are the U.S. leaders in wind power, and um, it's been exciting to see these remote villages in Alaska where it's it's dark for many months at a time. They're putting in wind turbines and they're putting in solar panels because. Outside of November, December, and January, the rest of the year, they got plenty of wind and plenty of sun. And, and so uh, even in these remote villages, they're trying to decrease um, their fossil footprint, and make use of almost unlimited uh, energy from these other sources. Right. The costs, the costs have been dropping so amazingly fast that are right. a lot of places that if you want to put in new energy generating capacity, the absolute cheapest way is renewable. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's hard for anything else to compete with that. Yeah, I have my house uh, is my whole south side of my roof is covered with solar panels. We haven't had an electric bill in five years. Um, we we took out a loan to get the, 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 the panels and we, we paid it off. Um, and so we heat, our hot, our water in the house, and we heat the house with the solar panels. And um, my husband just got an electric lawnmower and an electric leaf blower, so he knows he can just recharge those batteries using the solar panels. Um, and a lot of my neighbors are doing the same thing. So it's taking off. Amazing. Uh, are there any other questions that anybody has? I haven't seen any come in on the chat or Q&A in a little while. Just wanted to have one last check. All right. 
well, I, I did have one uh, thought, and we should probably wrap up here pretty soon, but so the, the lake, okay, you drill down there and you have a time period when the lake is persistently frozen over all the time. And yet you still have sediment accumulation that you can see in the core and study. Where's that sediment coming from if it can't be washing in from the surrounding landscape? You bet. We we thought a, a lot about this and it, I, I wish I could show, I probably should put in a, a picture of this. If you look at this lake that you're looking at in the here, if you look at it in June, it's completely covered with ice, but there's a moat around the edge of the lake. So that the, because the little creeks coming in, there's 50 little creeks, creeks that come into this uh, crater and that water in the creeks is warmed up to uh, the lake itself is around um, uh, four degrees, a little less than that, three degrees C, it's very cold. Uh, the streams coming in though, can sometimes be as much as 10 or 12 degrees C coming in, in June, because they're getting solar radiation. So that melts a moat, a little bitty moat around. So it might be maybe 10, 20, uh, uh, well, let's call it meters, 10 meters wide, where there's open water, but the lake itself is still covered with ice. And we kind of think that may have been what glacial summers were like. So you still were able to get sediments um, um, into the lake. And the other thing that uh, I didn't emphasize this, uh, but the truth is there are, there's a diatom ecology, these little photosynthetic diatoms that live in the surface, shallow surface waters, they never disappear. So, so even in the coldest glacial time, we still have 10% biogenic silica. So this means, this is an interesting phenomenon is that this lake may have had ice on it the year round, even in summer, but there was no snow to block the sun. So you get this ice canopy that still has enough light to, to still have a, a very flourishing uh, diatom uh, assemblage. So there's, there's got to be a food chain in there that, that persists even during cold times. Um, and, and so we've, we've really had to think, this has been a, a, a wonderful adventure for me over the years to really take my geology and link it to biology and ecology and all of these things, looking at how do we explain those the sediments that are that are down there today. All right, great. Well, I well, think I, we've probably come to the end of the questions. Uh, okay, and I just want to thank it. thank you for the <laughs> invitation. Um, and if students have any additional questions, please feel free to write to me. I, you mentioned earlier somebody might be writing some summaries, so. If they want to reach out to me, that's um, I'm happy to have the answer their emails. Great, thanks so much, Julie. Okay, thanks very much, and goodbye, and good luck with final exams and the rest of your semester. Stay safe.